We will now be looking at uh, the first stage of adulthood. We'll be looking at early adulthood, which, as you already know, in some countries, does not start till after. Uh, more specifically, in industrialized nations like ours in the United States, it does not start until after emerging adulthood. Here you see the traditional layout and uh, breakup of adulthood from early to late. And you can see in here that in early adulthood is where we have our optimum physical and cognitive functioning. That is to say that there's little decline, if any, uh, that has been noted uh, and recorded in early adulthood. But as we start getting into uh, middle adulthood, um, we start seeing that there are changes, but in middle adulthood, the changes are so gradual that, in fact, it's led to this being the least research stage because not a lot happens uh, during the ages of 40 to 65. And in late adulthood, we have uh, 65 until death. And this is where we once again pick up research because of some of the most noticeable physical and cognitive changes occurring during uh, these um, ages. It's important to note that aging is broken up into two uh, different types. Primary aging is uh, known as senescence, and that's basically uh, age-related changes that uh, are just bound to happen because of our biological makeup. Uh, the gray hair, the wrinkles, and all other uh, capabilities that were at their optimum in earlier stages are now uh, not as good as they used to be, and that is just something that occurs naturally. The secondary aging component is one that is due to environmental influences. Um, some of the best examples we could look at is looking at previous presidents when they take office and then uh, looking at them after uh, maybe one term and it's definitely after two terms and we're currently seeing it with our uh, with President Obama whose hair and appearance uh, has drastically changed from, from when he took office. And this would be an example of high stress level uh, and a lifestyle that is not conductive to uh, a gracious aging, if you will. Uh, not to mention, not only presidents are, are vulnerable to that, but also a lot of life experiences and circumstances also uh, can uh, bring about this secondary aging component. At this point, during uh, early adulthood, we see that uh, the brain and the nervous system will, for the most part, uh, attain stable size and, and weight. Um, so by the end of adolescence, it'll already be there. Uh, but uh, even after adolescence, we see that uh, new synaptic connections continue forming. And this is uh, often due to uh, the environment that we live in. If we are stimulated regularly, uh, then for the most part we will continue making new synaptic connections. If we uh, just stick to what we know and do not get outside our comfort zone, then um, fewer synaptic connections, if any, will be made. Physical exercise will also allow for that. and It is important to know that while the physical exercise is healthy in any kind, better than nothing, it's important to also change the routine and uh, realize that there are differences, maybe in just the posture alone or the stance. Um, and also, we see that um, the synaptic connections uh, allow us to become better at uh, regulating and controlling our emotions. And that's because um, the limbic system is regulated with a greater uh, sophistication and with greater efficacy. So we are not as emotional as we used to be when we were adolescents, hopefully. Uh, and while it is not nef definitely uh, something that we see across the board for every single adult, but uh, overall uh, we do see that it's less than among adolescents. Uh, the belief that uh, neurons can only be produced in earlier stages of our lives is now um, is false, and this is something that's called neurogenesis. Um, the replacement of dying neurons um, continues into adulthood, and we also find that many of them are produced, and once again, these are produced by a challenging behavior. Uh, excuse me, a challenging environment. Uh, we do not like problems, but the problems force us to think in ways that we wouldn't have possibly uh, had we not faced this circumstance or this, this struggle. So um, difficulties in life, um, different decisions to make, and and. and having the opportunity to go through it uh, facilitates this neurogenesis 
But despite uh, our brain's amazing capacity, we do uh, have research that shows that um, the brain begins to lose volume as we start getting older. So the gradual loss of speed and then all reactions um, and almost all bodily functions begins to occur. Uh, from metabolism to uh, maybe muscle uh, endurance and strength and uh, reactions. And that's what we see that sometimes as we get older, uh, we may not be able to, to um, be able to react by stepping on the brakes at the right time. So the uh, risk of uh, traffic accidents and deaths increases as we age. During the 20s and 30s, we have, again, the optimum uh, physical and cognitive capacity in all aspects of this in here. We see that we have more muscle tissue, so we may even be stronger than maybe in high school kids, more bone uh, calcium, uh, more brain mass that we see all throughout. Uh, and, and this is something that, again, will begin to gradual decline, but, but it's still at its maximum. Uh, better sensory modalities, as we may be able to perceive and, and, and sense things that we hadn't maybe paid attention to before. Uh, greater oxygen capacity, which allows our cells to be healthy. And also our immune system, for the most part, is quite well. This is assuming that all primary and secondary um, components are in a healthy uh, fashion. But if we were to be in an environment where things are not well, perhaps drinking excessively or or with high stress levels, then we would see that this would not be the case. But again, overall, 20s and 30s in the United States, uh, we, we see that our body systems are at uh, optimum capacity during this stage. Our fertility is also uh, going to be uh, at a high point in here, but we see that toward the end of uh, early adulthood, um, there begins to be a decline. We know that um, fertility, in regards to fertility, we are at our optimum in the late teens and early 20s. That's when our bodies seem to be uh, at greatest capacity. Uh, unfortunately, cognitively and maybe financially, we're not set yet. Um, at the age of 30, we begin to see a drop uh, in, in women. Uh, it is seen through their ovulation, which may become uh, intermittent, um, more sporadic. They may become what's known as irregular. And in men's fertility, well, we see that for the most part it's not as drastic as it is in women. Um, for the most part, there will be also uh, some diminished sperm count in men also after 30. For the most part, disease-free men uh, are able to father children throughout their entire lives. It's not unusual sometimes to hear, well, maybe it is unusual, but it's not uh, extremely surprising to hear that a 70-year-old man fathered uh, a child with naturally a younger woman. And, and this is uh, what speaks about our fertility, or the fertility in men being more gradual and uh, a lifelong process, whereas in women, uh, the uh, fertility comes to a, a halting stop that, that is seen uh, and felt by women through symptoms, a series of symptoms that we call uh, menopause. And uh, it is believed that the reason why it's so uncomfortable is because it's a sudden stop. It's not something that is as gradual as it is seen in men. It's important to note that uh, there are natural causes for uh, diminished sperm count, but there are also environmental causes. And um, some of the ones that have been studied is an increase in estrogen uh, intake. Um, there are also... Uh, conflicting reports on um, the use of or exposure to radiation. Uh, when, whenever we have a cell phone in our pocket as men, um, there have been some studies that um, point to a decreased sperm count in men who have that practice of carrying the, the, the phone there. Um, also, laptops and uh, being held in our laps uh, are not recommended for fertility purposes. Um, we know that the um, testicles have to be at a typically a lower body temperature than, than, than the body, redundant here, but they have to be uh, at a lower temperature than 98 degrees. And um, when we hold our laptop in our laps, um, the temperature can reach high uh, levels and it can also uh, hinder um, spermatogenesis, which is the production of sperm and its motility and its, and its uh, the quality of it as well.
So several environmental causes also lead to this. Unfortunately, um, even though we're no longer as vulnerable as when we were children, uh, sexual violence is uh, of research uh, and of interest uh, during the uh, adulthood stage. And the reason why is because um, sexual violence and, and coercion is not perhaps only seen as a gun drawn and a knife to the neck. Uh, we actually see a lot of coercion uh, against their will, but uh, in a more subtle fashion. Uh, we find that more than three four quarters of sexually violent incidents occur in the context of some kind of relationship. And that's what's known as date rape. And this occurs during the time where um, our young adults are going to college and they're dating and they're trying to fit in still. Uh, so we find that this is a, um, something that reflects about maybe us not having an identity in place if this is something we're given into. The argument is that if someone has an identity in place and they... Uh, feel autonomous and they feel uh, they, they could trust in the world and they feel they take initiative and they're industrious and they have an identity then they'd be less likely to uh, undergo some traumatic experience like this. Uh, the effects of this uh, are wide-ranging. We have uh, anywhere from sexual dysfunctions um, to physical trauma, pregnancy, uh, PTSD and, and sadly um, uh, lifelong uh, problems among many uh, when it comes down to relationships. The relationship um, um, stability and romantic relationship satisfaction is actually uh, typically lower among people who have gone through experiences like these and, and also a lot of attachment and a lot of insecurity and a lot of infidelity. So um, this is something that has gotten a lot of interest because of the effects it has on individuals. The mental health problems uh, continue at this, at this point, and, and the risk of uh, almost any type of emotional disturbance is actually higher in early adulthood than it, it is in middle age. And this is believed to be a combination of high expectations imposed typically by society and highest levels of role conflict. Uh, you not knowing uh, what you need to do or what your role is in life and this often leads to emotional difficulties, which can bring about anxiety, depression, and uh, even a list of maybe even personality disorders that could come about. It is also important to note that the biological argument uh, for this occurring at higher rates during um, early adulthood is that, um, like schizophrenia, oftentimes the onset is uh, during 20s, um, there are researchers that believe that um, we were born with a predisposition maybe to suffer from emotional disturbances and that at a particular age it would be seen and this age would be uh, typically in the 20s. That matched with the environmental components discussed earlier uh, is what gives way to this higher number of people with emotional disturbances. Of the um, mental health problems that are reported, anxiety is the most common. Uh, and anxiety actually is a big umbrella under which there are phobias, OCD, and uh, what we mean by generalized anxiety disorders. That's what, what GAD stands for, generalized anxiety disorder. And this is a condition in which individuals are constantly worrying about something. They don't know what, but there's a heightened state of a stress and, and alert that they experience. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, there's an obsession and there's compulsion component behind it. You may have heard of people who, who need to have maybe the, um, the gel and the hairspray and their comb and the lotion all aligned, otherwise they start feeling anxiety. Uh, it's been said that all of us have a little bit of OCD in us, but it becomes problematic when, for example, you're at work or in school and you keep wondering if that is okay and you cannot focus uh, on the task that you're supposed to. And a phobia is an anxiety form, but it has a cue. So a phobia will only be presented if they see something. For example, a phobia of snakes, uh, then I, I'll be okay as long as I don't see one. Whereas with OCD and GAD, um, excuse me, specifically GAD, there's no cue. They don't know what's triggering it. It could be a series of things. Mood disorders like depression and, um, and mania or manic episodes are the second most common. 
uh, and their suicidal thoughts and depression, and that often brings about substance abuse as they tend to self-medicate. And schizophrenia, a mental disorder that's characterized by disturbances of thought. And what we mean by disturbances of thought is that their reality seems to be different. Uh, they hear voices, oftentimes see, so they have hallucinations. And that's what we mean by the disturbances of their thoughts. And this is often diagnosed in early adulthood, but it's not unique to that. We've seen that earlier, and we've also seen that uh, in later stages. Substance abuse uh, is a, a big problem that we have here in the United States and in other countries as well. Uh, but uh, alcoholism and, and drug addiction actually peak between the ages of 18 to 40. Um, they typically decline uh, gradually after, um, as people find their place in life and their roles, they tend to make peace with that and they find other ways to cope with it and they no longer have to prove themselves to be worthy of, of the crowd or being cool. Um, but there are higher rates for men than women. Um, and, and the argument made that have, has been made by, um, that it's been hypothesized, I should say, is that women are encouraged by society to speak about their problems, whereas men, sometimes we don't. We deal with it in what we consider maybe a, a manly way, and that may be through substance abuse, uh, that may be through womanizing, that may be through violence, whereas women, um, they may feel comfortable going to their girlfriend and, and crying and sharing a heartfelt moment, whereas men, as a, a man who may be too conscientious about uh, his sexuality and his orientation may struggle to maybe find comfort in his guy friend's um, shoulder, um, may struggle to admit that he is sad, may struggle to admit that he is weak and that he needs uh, a shoulder to cry on. Uh, binge drinking is uh, basically taking... Uh, multiple drinks simultaneously during a short period of time. And, and this is something that's encouraged in social settings like university, college settings. Um, there is a sense of reward by peers if you were to finish you know, 240s and with a beer bong, and this leads to uh, higher intoxication. And, uh, of course, liver damage, unprotected sex, and, and death, and various other risks.